So this is a joint work with also with Sarah Plosker um, from Brandon, as well as uh, what Satish did. And um, oh, doesn't okay. Let's try that again. Okay. There we go. So uh, this is really going to be, well, okay, an alternate title for this would have been a norm I like, but, but somehow that maybe felt uh, not a good enough title, so I called it this. But this is really about a norm I like. So the, the situation uh, can be dressed up in quantum, uh, quantum words, but really I'm not a quantum person, so we'll just dress it up in my, my own usual language. Okay, so the usual suspect, X is a compact house star space, you have the Borel sets in, in that topology, um, the finite or separable, separable uh, Hilbert space, you know, choose finite if you prefer, you have the trace class operators, and you have the vector states or the states, the density operators coming from, from those things. Um, now that's not all the states, but the, there, there's enough of the states for us. So uh, we're really concerned with operator valued measures. So an operator valued measure is just, is just uh, the usual um, type of thing from the Borel sets into uh, bounded operators on the Hilbert space. Uh, it's a function that is ultra weakly countably additive when you have disjoint um, measurable sets. Okay, so uh, ostensibly the new of the union of everything should be the sum of, of everything when they're disjoint where this sum is really converging in the ultra weak topology, which means that whenever you take a state and you take the trace of that thing, then, then you have convergence for, for every state. And uh, th these have been around for a, a long time and have been studied in many contexts. Um, so there's nothing, uh, nothing too new um, there. Okay. Now we don't want just any old uh, operator valued measures. The best ones, of course, are the positive operator valued measures. So just everything is, uh, becomes a positive operator. Um, this also makes, right, a new be a finite measure since everything sits underneath new of, of the whole space, new x, right? So we have, have uh, finiteness here. Now, really, we want to understand these, these operator value measures through classical complex measures, because that's, that's what we really have a handle on. So if you take a, take a full rank uh, um, state, okay, you can think of whatever, um, one, one, one half, one quarter, one eighth down the diagonal, right? It, it has finite trace, but maybe you have to divide by two to make sure it's a state. Something like that. Um, then we can define this new uh, measure, new row, uh, to be the trace of row of uh, new of E. And this is a finite positive uh, measure on your space. Um, and because of the, 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 the row being full rank, then this is uh, mutually absolutely continuous with respect to, to, to uh, new, right? So if new of E is zero, if and only if new row of E is zero. And we can define some more classical measures, um, new ij, uh, just to be the inner product of uh, new E applied to ej uh, with ei. And these are, again, complex uh, measures, okay, where you're working over the orthonormal basis. Now, uh, these are all, uh, absolutely continuous with respect to new, uh, which is the same as new row. So they all live on underneath new row. So there are radon nicotine derivatives, um, d nu ij, d nu uh, row. Okay, and each of these of course recovers, um, recovers this. So we define a, a sort of global radon nicotine derivative just by thinking well, I use tensor notation, but whatever, you just think of it as a giant matrix or a giant operator where the ij entry is the ij radon nicotine derivative. Um, and this, this by some theory is going to be positive when you have a positive operator value measure uh, almost everywhere. And um, 
really, this could be this could be pretty bad depending on uh, how you start off with your POVM. So we're really only interested when this radon nicotine derivative gives you a bounded operator at almost everywhere. Okay, that doesn't have to happen, but uh, but um, if you're in the matrices or something like that, it'll be give you a bounded operator. That's not really a strong condi condition. It's just a, a natural one. So uh, what is this wonderful quantum random variable? Well, it's just a measurable function. That's, that's all it means um, from x into b of h. And measurable here means, well, you can just say that when you multiply it by a state and take the trace, all of those have to be measurable functions with respect to new row. So we say that, that one of these quantum random variables is, is, uh, is new integrable provided each of these um, fs functions is new a new row integrable, right? So you take your f, you hit it on both sides by the square root of your radon nicotine derivative, which is positive, which was positive, so we can take its square root. And then you hit it with a, with a state and then you take its trace. Okay, so if all of these are integrable, we say that, that uh, f is integrable, and we can implicitly define the integral then, uh, the integral with respect over x of f with respect to, to nu, just in this way. So trace of s of, of uh, this thing is the integral of f of s. Um, another way to think about this is you could recover the uh, ij entry of the integral by hitting it with the appropriate state. Um, so there's a trivial situation. The trivial situation is when you start off with a finite positive measure uh, and then you just multiply it by the identity uh, over your Hilbert space. This will be a POVM and the radon nicotine is just this very trivial identity, okay? So then in this case, uh, integration of f with respect to d, d nu is just the same thing as integrating every single entry uh, with respect to mu um, uh, over your orthonormal basis. So, so really that's kind of the, the, the picture is this is just entry-wise integration, but when you're, you're new to something fancy, you have to kind of multiply it by this radon nicotine derivative to move it around to the correct place. Okay. So we have quantum random variables and, and uh, right? Think of the classical situation, you have measurable functions. We're not really interested in all measurable functions. We're interested in, in things that, that uh, act nicely, you know, that live in L1, for instance. So really what would be an L1 in this context, right? That's, that's uh, kind of the idea. And so we have some candidates uh, so I've already let the cat out of the bag. This is not the L1 norm. So if you uh, took your function, your quantum random variable f, and then you took its, uh, you know, operator absolute value, um, and then integrated it, and then took its, its uh, a norm, right? This kind of looks like an L1 norm. Is it an L1 norm? Well, it's not an L1 norm because, of course, we know classically that the operator absolute value is not really a good, uh, it's not a good norm-ish thing in itself, right? It doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. So this, this uh, is a classic example that you can find in places like uh, Bhatia and Kitna's uh, papers, um, but I'm sure it floated around for a while there. Um, so, you know, this, this positive uh, partial order is not, it's not a, a great one when it comes to norms. And so you can, you can, you don't have to read this very carefully, but you can turn this, this example into, into a, a version where you can see that this um, is, is not a norm. So you just have a two point space and you just have F and G be kind of opposites of each other. So F takes a at its first point, B at its second, and G takes A at its second point and B at its first. And so then when you uh, write it out, you see that, that this doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. So this isn't a norm, right? It's not a norm. Um, second, well, we can, we can create a norm in this space just by uh, 
taking the norm of f at each point, right? So I guess this would be f of x of, of uh, the norm times the identity. And now this is a quantum random, random variable again, and you can take its norm uh, after integration. Now, this, this does give you some things, but you have to think this is, this is really killing a lot of possibilities. So it's kind of too big to really be interesting. So it is a norm, but it's, it's uninteresting. So, uh, you know, here's a, an example of what I would consider to be a perfectly legitimate um, quantum random variable or positive function here, but it has an infinite norm in this, in this norm, right? So you just have x be zero to one, you have a countably infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space, you just have nu be the bag measure times the identity, right? So we know precisely what its integration should be. It's just entry-wise. And you have this function, right? You just, you just uh, chop it up and over each little interval, you know, it spikes a little bit higher as you go along, right? Um, this will always be into the bounded operators, uh, which is nice. But, right, when you uh, start adding these things together, well, if you take the norm in particular, right, that kills off this uh, characteristic function. Um, or rather, not the characteristic function. It kills off the ENN and replaces it with identity. So it, it, uh, it's just adding over and over again. It gives you infinity, which is not, not so great. Um, so uninteresting, uh, it does have some counterparts um, that people have looked at. Uh, I think it would give you something akin to L1 tensor B of H, um, but uh, it's not quite clear what it, what it gives you, but we're not going to, uh, to deal with it. So instead, I want to propose a norm that sits underneath this thing, uh, and somehow recovers this previous norm that's not a norm, right? So can we make this situation into a norm? And uh, with Sarah, uh, we, we define this, this new uh, concept of a one norm. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, my apologies if it does exist somewhere else. So first, just take the span of all positive quantum random variables that are new integrable, okay? Um, and, uh, right, what do we do? Well, we take the, uh, take all possible ways of writing F as the linear combination of four positive, uh, QRVs, right? And you just sum them up and take their integral and take their norm. Okay. So, um, at least when this thing is self-adjoint, right? Uh, the absolute value of F is one possible way of taking F as a difference of two positive um, operator um, uh, functions, right? It would be F plus minus F minus. Uh, but there are other possibilities that could sit underneath that, right? So um, when you're in one variable, at one point, right, if you have a matrix or an operator and uh, it's self-adjoint, then, then the, the absolute value of, of A is basically giving you the, the lowest norm possible way of writing um, A as the difference of, its, of a positive and a negative. Uh, but when you start adding points, there are other possibilities, which is, is very intriguing to me. Um, so it's not hard to show that this is, this is a semi-norm. Um, just because you, you, yeah, it's very, very easy because of the, the uh, infimum. And so is this, does this give you anything, right? Well, interestingly, uh, yes, it's a semi-norm, as I said, but uh, when you quotient out by everything that this, that goes to zero, um, then actually this, this is complete already. So uh, you have a, a bonic space um, in this. 
And uh, that's not really that hard uh, to show uh, once, you, once you've um, thought about it too carefully. Okay. So this really does give you, give you a new uh, L1 space. Um, and this is, this is true in, in general, um, but somehow we can, we can trivialize these uh, a little bit. So if your radon nicotine derivative is invertible everywhere and or almost everywhere and it and its inverse are essentially bounded um, in their norm, uh, then uh, this one norm with new with respect to new is is actually just the same thing as the one norm given by by this um, sort of classical looking one, which is which is quite interesting. Okay, so uh, just here's a little little norm example coming out of uh, again matrices provided by Badia and Kitna's uh, papers, and probably are older. Um, so, so here's an example, right? We have two points. Uh, the first one is positive. The second one is clearly not positive. And so if you just sum them together and take their norm, we see that that, that gives you none. Now, if you uh, take the um, absolute value at each point, right? Then this all of a sudden bumps you up to a matrix uh, that has norm 11, okay? And so ostensibly the one norm uh, of this function could be somewhere between the two of them. And indeed it is actually. So with this clever choice of two uh, positive functions, right, we can split the matrix three, zero, zero, negative three into the difference of these two positive matrices. And when you add them together and add them onto the first, uh, you actually get nine again. So, um, the integral of the function should always be thought of as the, the lower bound, the possible, possible lower bound. But here we actually do recover uh, this lower bound and it's sitting underneath this, this number 11, which is, I find that very intriguing, right? So how to compute this norm, I have no idea. I have a summer student uh, looking, you know, doing some numerical calculations. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how far they get. So. Uh, Chris, there's a question in the chat. Is, uh, is there an easy example of an F such that the uh, norm of F, the one norm of F is zero, I guess, that w something that's in the- oh, oh yeah, good, good question. I should have mentioned that. So um, essentially the, 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 um, the only way you're ever going to have the one norm of F uh, B zero is if every so if you go back to just the classical case where you're just doing entry wise integration, um, every single entry would have to have one norm uh, zero. Uh, so the only way you're going to have um, a quantum random variable give you one norm zero would be essentially that it's hiding behind the where the support is missing or something like that. So this is not eliminating any like good natural candidate. Um, this is preserving everything that has content, uh, so to speak. Uh, there was also a comment from Marius in the chat that these norms have been considered by Polvello, Hagerup, and Pizier as DEC norm or DEC norms of oh, maps okay. from uh, I um, infinity to B of H. Oh, okay, great, great. That's, that's good to know. Um, yeah. So uh, they're they're uh, quite intriguing, though. Um, now there is a one 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 problem with these is that uh, multiplication by essentially bounded um, quantum random variables they they don't necessarily give you bounded multipliers. So if you have an L one uh, function, you have an L infinity function, you multiply to them together that's not necessarily an L1 function again. So this, this could be a little concerning when you're trying to do some topo topological thing. However, uh, if you just consider L infinity without the H, uh, then, then we do actually get some bounded multipliers and we get enough of them. So this family of, of uh, linear functions, sent, uh, Fs that gets sent to the trace of uh, S times uh, integral of G of F, this does that give you continuous linear functions and there's enough of them to separate the points of uh, L1H. 
And so we just say that this, this uh, is called weak convergence if, if every converges for every function. So that is a, a concern, you know, but, but you don't have quite as much um, latitude there. Okay, so at the very end, I'll talk about for a couple minutes uh, the, the title object, but that's fine. We, we uh, Satish gave, gave us some um, doubly stochastic things which are also called Markov, which are also called bistochastic. So a bistochastic operator on L1H is just a, a positive operator. It preserves integrals and it sends the identity to the identity. Now, it, it's uh, quite easy to show that this is contractive in this one norm, which is quite nice. And uh, we can get a big family of these things um, by in certain situations, right? So if you have, if you start with a finite positive measure, uh, then every bistochastic operator on the classic L1x mu extends to a unique bistochastic operator uh, on L1h just by this uh, sort of modularity property. Um, however, it's, it's uh, I don't know if this is all the bistochastic operators, but they're certainly the tractable ones. Um, so, uh, just like Satish was saying, right, we say one uh, L1H function is majorized by another if the, 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 the bigger one can multiply down by a bistochastic operator to the smaller one, right? This is a very uh, common definition. And um, in the, the you know, classic case, right? We know doubly stochastic matrices are just given by the convex hull of the permutation matrices. So um, in the, the classic uh, case, right, at least when you take um, products of the in interval 0, 1 with the product Lebesgue measure, then uh, James Brown in 1966 proved that um, the convex hull of the invertible measure preserving maps uh, is weakly dense in in all of the bistochastic operators, um, where weakly dense, uh, you have to, it's like a little bit more specific than that, but um, we did that. And, uh, you know, we should end every good bistochastic majorization talk with some, something to do with convex functions. So sort of a proof of, uh, proof of um, how all these L1 um, H functions work. Um, to show that they're nice enough is this idea that majorization is just the same thing as um, all uh, a certain class of convex functions from L1H into the real numbers um, preserves this order. And uh, you know, this, is, this extends a nice result of Komiyas in the multivariate majorization case. Um, and it all kind of hinges on a Bonnock uh, separation um, argument um, using the weak topology that uh, was introduced earlier. Um, but I think I've, oh, I've gone over a minute or two, so I probably will end there. Thanks. <laughs>